Welcome to Tony Unleashed, the podcast where we unleash the truth about all things pets. Our research and anecdotal evidence matched with pet expert interviews will help you help your pet thrive. We are here to answer questions, divulge information, and spread awareness about what's really going on in the world of pets. I am your co-host, Emily Taylor, pet nutrition enthusiast. And I'm Tony Shalaski, owner of Healthy Pet Products with three locations in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, and recently expanded to Port Charlotte, Florida. Welcome to the show. Welcome to another episode of Tony Unleash the Podcast. I am thrilled today to have Daniel Shuloff, CEO and founder of Keto Natural Pet Foods, joining me today. Daniel is not just an entrepreneur, but also an activist, science writer, dedicated to shedding light on the conflicts of interest and flawed science behind the pet food industry. Daniel, welcome to Tony Unleashed. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thank you for the nice introduction. Awesome. I can't tell you how I I have to say, I mean, we'll get into this more, but um, we have so much to talk about that we are going to start off with, um, I find it Tell us, I, I really want to hear how you got into the pet food industry because I find it fascinating that you left um, a career as being an attorney to um, focus on pet health issues. How did that happen? I mean, the, the, the shortest possible answer is that I got my own dog and I became very interested in taking care of him in a conscientious and caring and thoughtful way. Um, the longer answer is that, um, you know, in essence, what happened is it started like a personal project and then it kind of bloomed into something that occupied so much of my life that it became a professional project. Um, it's like, I got this dog, I got this Rottweiler when I was, and I was, so I was, like you said, I was an attorney, young man, single man, big city, too many hours, lonely existence got this dog. He was my best friend at the time. He, we were bros and, um, like Rottweiler, you might, you sure, you know, he was like quintessentially Rottweilery where he was like an intense dog and he needed exercise every day. I gave him exercise every day, but I was also a busy person. And as I like learned more about how to exercise him in the way that was best for his health, mm -hmm. I learned about the problem of obesity among dogs and cats in the Western world. And it kind of blew me away and fascinated me both as it pertained to him. But then like the more I looked into it, the more it was like, there's so much here that's not, I can't find the information yep. I'm looking for as I go looking for this. That things look wrong here based on what I know about things. And how is this all happening? Is that kind of vibe, that kind of feeling? And so I started writing about it, um, intending it to be for myself. It blossomed into like, there's more here. And I kind of like, at first was like, oh, I'll put out like a, an ebook, like as part mm -hmm. as like a side, what we call today, like a side hustle. Like I could probably like, other people would find value in this if I like, put this, these notes that I've been keeping into one place about the science evidence-based, uh, exercise for your dog. And, but then I'd like, as I'd get into it, I would realize that the project had like bigger scope than I appreciated at the outset. And so I'd like burn it down and like start with a different target in mind. I'd say like, maybe this will can become a full on book that I could get published. And then it'd be like, this is a better story than that standard. This is, I can write the definitive book about this bizarre phenomenon. And it's, that's obviously a bigger project. And so like, once it got to that scope, it's full time. I'm traveling around the country. Huh. I'm like going to visit people in far flung places. I'm in Yellowstone national park, blah, blah, blah. And so I had to leave my job and that was kind of the, you know, that was the, do or die moment. So it was um, like an obsession. Almost. Sort of. Yeah. I mean, I was obsessed with it. Yeah. I still am obsessed with sure. it. I just find it really interesting. It's got, it's one of these things. It's like so hard to, it started as like so hard to explain. Mm -hmm. It's like, what, how on earth could, you know, the mm -hmm. two facts I always tell everybody about obesity and dogs and cats. 
are number one, it's the norm. It's so common that it's the norm. More they're than big half- boned. No, Daniel, they're big boned. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, very few people like appreciate it, yep. but it's it's insanely common and it's worse for them than a lifetime of smoking is for you and I. It's like those are two facts that should never coexist, and yet they do. And even worse, it's the kind of thing you'd think given the amount of control we exert over these animals, we would all be able to like, not, this wouldn't be a problem. This would be the easiest thing in the world. And it's insanely popular anyway. And it's just like, what is that? And then the deeper I got into it, it became clear that there are bad guys in this story, Uh that there are folks who have done that knowingly done things that have caused harm. And that adds a whole different kind of motivation to it, at least in my weird psyche. It's like, these are people that deserve a comeuppance. These, this is like unrighted wrongs. And you start to get that kind of motivation and interest in it where it's like, I feel like I'm doing a good thing. I feel Mm -hmm. like I'm pursuing justice or something. And there's an agenda behind what they're doing. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. So it's, so part of it was stemmed from you're kind of naturally focused and and you're a, you're an iron man that that's part of it but did that rottweiler have any health issues you just kind of when i when i first learned about obesity uh-huh. my diagnosis my self diagnosis using like a body composition chart mm-hmm. was like oh this dog is probably fatter than he ought to be like I, I never would have thought I was at one point in that kind of position where sure. I was like, um, what were you feeding the original food? So before any of this, when I first started, like went to the pet store for the first or pet food store the first time, I think I was feeding a brand. I think the company is diamond. Uh-huh. I think as I learned more be- but before I founded my own company, I would feed Origin Original and Mm -hmm. Origin Six Fish. I became, over the course of writing my book, almost a one-issue shopper. Like, you know, the book is about this problem of obesity and trying to explain it, but it's kind of got like a big scientific thesis that it's built around, which is that dietary carbohydrate is far worse for dogs than the veterinary community will tell you and particularly with regard to obesity, that it's kind of the fundamental cause of obesity in dogs. So I became sort of a one issue shopper around like, I wanna feed my dog as little carbohydrate as possible. At the time, Origin was the best affordable for me version of that. And so that's what I did then. Then I founded my own company that makes much lower carbohydrate food. And now he's been, or he was fed that for the last half of his life. Right, right. So, and I can tell you because I'm on the front lines with customers day in and day out, some, I think a good percentage would be like, ah, carbs, how big of a deal could it be? But I, it's the trigger to everything. It's the trigger to inflammation, stress, disease. It's the trigger to everything. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, like I said, I'm as, when I try to like think about how any try to put like a universal sort of framework on how any, but any shopper goes about thinking about what food to feed their dog. There are other things that I would think of as like more important than nutritional optimization in a way. It's like, there are things like, will my dog actually eat this food? My dog has to like it. You know, is this going to cause acute disease in my dog, either because it's poison or it's contaminated or it's, you know, going to cause a deficiency disease. Besides those fundamentals, in my judgment, if you're feeding a dog a diet that is complete and balanced and you trust the brand that's making it and that it's that it truly meets the complete and balanced standard um, that it claims to, beyond that, for me, by far the most important thing is like reduce carbs as much as possible, increase protein as much, meat-based protein as much as possible. Everything else is small potatoes after that, in my judgment. Yep. Agreed. 100%. It's so, and it's like, there's a million, you know, I wrote a whole book explaining that, but it it's like the thing that I always like to try to highlight for folks that are trying to like judge how important this issue should be for them is like, it's much more substantive than the vast majority. It's measurable. 
the impact when your dog eats carbohydrate, things happen that you can verify. Most of the things that are on like a bag of pet food that have to do with like what country was it made in or what's the ingredient quality and stuff like that. It's like, it's really just, you got to believe you're not going to see any visible difference for the most part. You might convince yourself that your dog is somewhat different, but like carbohydrate is like, if you measure your dog's blood glucose, it changes after that meal Mm -hmm. hugely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Body composition over a demonst like a short ish period of time changes in ways you can see the animal leans out and stays muscular. Like they're not, it's not just like fluff, you know, wellness jargon. It's like, yeah, it has, has real measurable differences. And so, so yeah. in, in response to that glucose sugar, uh, customers ask us all the time, why is my dog always hungry? Why is my dog always hungry? So two reasons they're opportunistic eaters. So they're always on the hunt for food. It's just what, how they're, how, how they're wired. They're hardwired to be always on the hunt for food. But if that's a kibble fed dog, their sugar spikes right after they eat and then it plummets. And that exactly. triggers hunger. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, I mean, that is definitely like, um, you know, I, I am somebody that believes eating rel- as little carbohydrate as your lifestyle can allow mm-hmm. is helpful and efficacious for people as well. Agreed. Um, and yet, as you mentioned before, one of my like hobbies, personal hobbies is I do these really long endurance events. And in those events, carbohydrate is fundamental dietary car like you it's just like a part of in order to get your body to do certain things that last a long time Mm -hmm. it needs to use carbohydrate as fuel so you're eating a lot and it's just also like a ton of exercise like my hobby and And so i eat carbohydrate but i'll tell you like there's and i'm a a skeptic about like wellness info and stuff like that Uh but like one thing that I swear by that is so tangible for me about car, if I go through a period where I'm being really good about not eating carbohydrate, when I wake up in the morning, I do not feel at any point throughout the morning, like a feeling of growly stomach hunger. Whereas if I'm eating like I do more often where I'm just like eating a fair amount of junk food because I'm doing crazy volume, like I, you know, I feel the typical wake up in the morning. I am hungry for breakfast, growly stomach feeling. But if I don't eat carbs, I do not get that. And that's what I like. That is a, a, a very tangible uh, experience of the what you're describing that I expect my dog is get. You know, it's hard to know what a dog is feeling. Sure. But uh, yeah, that that's that's always something I associate. With absolutely. That absolutely. So, OK, so then what came next? The, the the book came next. The, the book was first and then Keto yeah, Natural. Yeah. yeah. So I worked the book. The book took four years. Oh my so God. I, I, yeah. I left the job in 2011. I published it in 2016. And um, when it got published, it did like a, a little bit of kind of promotional type stuff. But like by the time I was getting to the end stages of it, I had done enough that I knew that the main thesis that I was developing was that carbohydrate is the fundamental cause of this particular problem. And that socially there's like the science thesis behind it, right? The carb is the problem, but there's also this kind of like part of it. That's more like a, I guess you'd call it like a social thesis, which is that like the reason that the science that clearly proves that carbohydrate is the problem here is not more broadly appreciated in the pet owning public and in the veterinary community is that industry has like exerted its influence in a way that has misinformed those communities. And so there's the broad that that's like the thing that matches it too. So both those are getting developed as I'm like reaching the end of the book. And if you were somebody that felt that way as well, if you either read my book and felt persuaded by it, or you came to those beliefs, like, you know, you like on your own and you're sharing those beliefs I didn't think there was a pet food company that was like right for you at that time. If you wanted to feed your dog a low carb diet, you're either feeding raw, either commercially balanced product or something you're preparing yourself, or you're feeding something like champion pet foods origin, which is like as low a carb kibble as you could find back then, but was still like 
30% digestible carbohydrate. And so I was already like towards the end of the book, I was like hip that like when this is out, I'm going to figure out a way to make kibble without the carbohydrate and make a company to deliver this kind of product for people that feel this way. So the book came and then the pet food came. How long did it take to develop the actual food? It had to be a long time. It took about a year. That's it. it. I mean, (laughs) yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I guess it's like, uh, it's not straightforward. Like there's, there are multiple reasons why that kind of product didn't exist until we came along. But one of them is that it's not super straightforward. Like if you've ever tried to like making kibble is a lot like making meaty bread. It's like you mix a bunch of dry ingredients together. You add moisture to them so that they, they hold together Mm -hmm. and then you heat them up and then you dry it out at the end, you take the moisture back out once it's bound together in individual little nuggets, which if you think about it is a lot like making a loaf of bread on a smaller scale and with meat. It's like you mix these ingredients together. The ingredients have a binding quality. And then when you heat it up, they become cohesive like nuggets. But the binding, the thing that does the binding Mm -hmm. in like bread is flour, is diets, is starch. And it's like you heat starch and it does what's called gelatinize. It gelatinizes. And that means that like the, like the, the, the structure of the molecule changes in a way that gets all the ingredients to hold together. Yep. So you try to make a loaf of bread or a muffin or something like that without flour. It doesn't want to do that. It just yep. wants to fall apart and not hold together. So do, figuring out how to get kibble to hold together the way it needs to without with as little carbohydrate as possible, sort of like the main challenge of that year. Absolutely. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's just like it, 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 you have to think outside the box to get there, but it's not like splitting the atom, you know what right, I mean? Right. Right. And I've like folks figured out how to do it now that low carb is such a popular, um, you know, social phenomenon in a way, like it, it's something that people identify with. There are human use products that have, have kind of squared the circle in the same way. You can go find bread that is true, that is very low in carbohydrate content. And it's pretty much, it's not French baguette right out of the oven, but it's like not bad. Yeah. And ice cream and things like that. It's like f- folks that are smart about this stuff can solve that problem. So I've heard that it is hard though, when you, the, the higher that protein goes, the extrusion process does become more challenging. I guess you figured all that out. Yeah. I mean, it's the reality of it in my judgment. I mean, yeah. in my experience, sure. is that different proteins have different, like cause different problems within the extrusion process. Makes I wouldn't sense. say it's as simple as saying. Cause like, they have more moisture. I'm having moisture. Yeah. And they react differently to heat. Okay. And there's just different like components to it. It wasn't just a, we're tweaking one variable trial and error. It wasn't that simple. Interesting. Um, it's not, like I said, it's not differential calculus, but like it was, uh, yeah, it takes some, some, a fair amount of years worth of trial and error. It, in essence, it's like you do a fair amount of computer work at the baseline to try to put together based on what you think you're going to get once it, run, it runs it through the machine, but then you've got to actually go through that process. And like, we're a small, we're a small startup company. We still are. It's like running machines to do that kind of trial and error is expensive. And it's not something that is just like simple to do. You're talking about tens of thousands of dollars, every trial that you do that. And so you're like, yeah. And it's like, not, you know, doesn't work a lot of the time. And you're just like, there was my tens of thousands of dollars, Gonzo. You know, it didn't hold together. It's too dusty. And Lou, you legit can, you think it's accurate? You're the lowest carb kibble on the market? There's another product that I don't think is still being made. There's a com- the company that still exists uh-huh. called Visionary. Are you familiar with them? Never heard of them. They were around before Keto Natural was around, uh, but they were making raw diets exclusively okay right? raw and fresh like non-kibble products okay after we made ketona they started making a kibble product too they use the keto prefix in places on that as well 
Um, and it was like the old, we were on an island, us and them, and then everybody else. Um, they have they at least stopped temporarily, and I think they're just done with it. I don't know the people there very well. Um, we're not in like we don't have a like a competitor relationship really, mm -hmm. even though we're like the only two doing it. Because in my feeling, it's like we just need the broader that pie, the bigger the universe of people that believe the truth, which is that carbohydrate is bad for your dog. Yep. The we're all going to win yep. right now. That's smallish group of people, unfortunately, but yeah, they were the only ones that were like remotely close origin to my knowledge is the other, the next closest and their recipes are in the twenties and thirties. I thought nature's logic might, I thought it was on the low end. It might be. It might be. Yeah. I think those, like, I think, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Okay. I would be surprised to look, I would essentially be hearing about for the first time, a kibble that's under 10% dietary carbohydrate other it, than us. It's definitely not that low, but I think it's in the thirties. Uh, I think it's. Oh yeah. That, that wouldn't surprise me at okay. all. That's okay. Like, that's like the, you know, next best thing is like that class of products. That's like champion pet foods, origin line, not the Econa line. Um, even blue wilderness. I often tell people oh, like, yo, please, no. <laughs> I know, but look, yo, if you add up the numbers on really? that, it's better, it's better than a lot of pricier foods, in my judgment. Higher right. protein content, All lower right. carbohydrate content. It's not great. It's yeah. not great. Yeah. But it's there. Are, you can spend more money and get less for your money than that. Okay. okay. I believe. Good to know. Yeah. Hey, I, I, I can tell I'm you're a researcher. And don't, don't get me wrong. I'm in no like hurry to, to pat them on the back. Yeah. But that's the reality of how I feel about their, uh, that line, you know, they, sure. have, they make lines that are 50% digestible carbon. There's so many lines. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's the more skews they can have, the happier they are. You should see how big, well, I, I, one part of your book I've really found, I chuckled at, I didn't read it cover to cover. I literally got it a week ago and just kind of skimmed through the whole, through bits and pieces, but it's I loved good. the, um, how cynical you were about when you went to super Sue. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. It's, what a joke. it's such a riot. You've been to that, I suppose. I go every year to super zoo and every year to global and have for almost 15 years. Yeah. I don't even really go anymore because our company at right now, and this actually is probably going to change. But right now we sell everything over internet based channels. Like yeah. you, we don't really make an effort to be in brick and mortar stores for business reasons, I, really. Like, I totally it's like, got it's, that. It's just a developmental timeline for us. Like this is something we can go further with our limited resources right now. But as a result, like the, the whole thing of super zoo, the main value there is to like meet potential new mm -hmm retail and distributor partners. It's not like individual pet owners are walking around. And so like it has much less of the value. So I kind of stopped going, but yeah, for those of you who are listening, who don't know what super zoo is, it's a big pet convention held in Las Vegas in the middle of the summer yep. <laughs> degrees or something. And it's just like football field after football field inside this, uh, it's, it's in man dude i don't even leave the building i literally don't leave yeah. the building yeah yep i do love i live in salt lake city utah yeah. so we're we're very quite close to las vegas and it's a place that i actually like a lot i go there often huh. um we're, we're climbers and there's climbing outside of vegas and there's such good food and stuff but super zoo is like a yeah yeah bizarre world man there's well, a lot of nonsense it there is but i go because you never i i find a good a couple good eggs at every show and i've been in the industry so long i know so many people that it's it's yeah that's true there are always yeah. people to see it's a good time to reconnect and everything but um so do you plan on getting into retail maybe yes oh, okay so uh we'll get to so my my dog is a big male St. Bernard. Yeah. And when he wants something, he is like, I have to really bear down to like physically stop him. And he just came really close to pushing like his monster gels into this. Oh, video. that would be um, perfect. Cause we're recording. Yeah, but it will like turn it all crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are we going to get into retail? I assume we're going to get into the Hills lawsuit soon. That has sort been one of two things that has really sparked uh, accelerated the timeline for us pushing into brick and mortar retail. Mm. And so the answer now is yes. 
we are planning to, I would expect within about a quarter, we will be aiming to do that. We're recording right now in early March. So like by the summer, I do think that we'll be making that a priority. Wow. Well, you have to keep me posted. Um, but of course. I mean, what I can tell you, and I'm on, um, I mean, from an, I've been in the pet industry for 15 years. Had I have four retail stores. We talk to customers all day long and we preach the carbohydrate story. We tell, we educate the consumers all day long, all day long to an extent. That sounds like it would be an excellent fit that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd love to. Yeah. Okay, great. We'll obviously stay in touch. We talked before the show about how the, the lawsuit it's hard to know at the early stages how long it'll go, but it's going to go for a period of time, I long figured. period of time probably. Yeah. And there might be worthy updates. There might very well be me coming back on this show. And maybe by that point we'll be, we'll be there with you. I assume, you know, already because it's so pertinent to retailers that the, that AFCO's like quantitative nutrition statement that's required to be used on the back of bags mm -hmm. is changing really dramatically in a way that's very pertinent to my kinds of products and my philosophy, but it sounds like yours as well. Absolutely. And we educate consumers too, that all the, the whole AFCO complete and balance is a bunch of bullshit. So. Fair enough. Yeah. But one of <laughs> you the can elaborate I, on your, the changes that are coming and what's good and not good. You know, there, so there's a big one. So right now, if you want to help your customer understand how much carbohydrate is in the food, you have to do a little uh -huh. bit of math. Uh -huh. It's not, you have to do some, and, and often you don't even have all the variables you need to do all the math, right? Like some of the, the constituent parts that have to, that are, that are make up the food aren't mandatory in the guaranteed analysis, right? And so some of the brand doesn't tell you ash content, you're sort of guessing to figure out how much carbohydrate, but you also have to know how to do the math. It's not just a line. None of them, That's, none of them have ash. None of them have the ash yeah, content. Maybe Waruva, maybe. And I think that's on the website, not even on the actual label. But did you know that AFCO is changing? The guarantee analysis panel is going away and is being replaced by a pet nutrition facts box that is not. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's the biggest change since they started making requiring calorie content. It's not, they've adopted the rules. You will not see it start to trickle down into stores. I would expect for something like two or three years because they have an implementation period. But the, the pet nutrition facts box has a carbohydrate line, has sub carbohydrate lines. So like dietary fiber, sugar, starch that are all mandatories. Okay. So five years from now, four years from now, when we have this conversation, you're not going to have to explain to your customers about, oh, you have to start with the protein number, subtract this out, that out, blah, blah, blah. Assume ash is this much. It's just on the bag. How on earth did that get approved? I'm shocked. And how well, did I well, not know 20, this? 20 years, of, 20 years of lobbying, basically. Like it took forever. It's criminal that it's taken so long, but it's just like it finally got through. Calories were the same story. It was yeah. like- Stuff happens on the human side, human side of uh, food products, packaged food products, and then consumer expectations start to run in alignment with those. And it's like you kind of can't, the arguments that were long used to keep carbohydrate off the label revealed themselves to be nonsense. Like something that you would hear at AFCO meetings circa seven years ago when folks were pushing for this is you would hear, well, we, we don't have a good methodology for directly testing carbohydrate content. Therefore, we can't require it. And it's like, yo, people, the United States FDA requires this on all human food uh -huh. products. So there, there is a way that's pretty good. And I now can tell you that like, when we produce food, the reason we're, we're really strong in saying what our carbohydrate content is, is because the lab offers that analysis. Sure. It's not it's not something that can't be done at all, but, and so anyway, that's, I think just generally the force that happened here is like for a long time, folks have gotten used to when they go to buy their, I have my diet Coke in a plastic cup this time, but usually on the back of a can of Coke, how much carbohydrate is in this? 
and their expectation delivers. And it's clear that the pet one doesn't line up with that. And so they face blowback, face blowback, and eventually cave. Wow. Do you go to AFCO meetings? Sometimes. Yeah. I've never Sometimes been. I did. I did more seriously when I was writing my book. And then I went this year too to their annual, I think it was, a, they, they hold two big meetings a year. Mm-hmm. One is like their semi-annual and one's like the annual or mid-year and annual. I went to the one that was like three months ago. Um, and the reason is because they're talking about this subject and it's a very important subject to me. And they're talking about implementation timelines and things like that. And so I couldn't really miss it, but, um, yeah, it turned out to be a little bit, it was, it wasn't super informative. Yeah. Yeah. I would think it would be a lot of redundant. It's regulatory language, man. It's not like you have to be, maybe it's because I'm a lawyer. I can like, I can keep my attention on it for lo- longer than the average bear, but like, it's pretty brutal. To yeah. Like I'm going to leave that to you. I'd lose my mind yeah. in something yeah. like that. There's none of the, the, the <laughs> pomp of super zoo. It was at like, <laughs> it was at a not looking so good. Where was it in Nebraska? <laughs> no, it was in either Tennessee or uh, Kentucky, but it was in like a totally, you know, not, a glitzy city. Yeah. It was in, yeah. But yeah. Uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. That's okay. Okay. Well, I'm thrilled the keto. So the actual food is called Ketona. Company name is That's Keto Natural. Line. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, the product line is Ketona. The company is Keto Natural Pet Foods. And currently available directly through Keto Natural? Yeah. And online retailers. Okay. So it's like the way to sell, like the, the reason. This is more than you ever wanted to know about pet food, but because you run brick and mortar stores, I feel like I need to justify myself. The not more you want to put know about pet food, but running a pet food. Um, the reason I want to know we, it all, and this is unrelated, but whatever. It's like we the reason we are all online is because that's how you can reach consumers in the most efficient mm-hmm. and like, like I learn how to market and test messaging and test ad copy, test offers in real time in a way that I can't do putting it in your store and reacting that day. Every day I can get a thousand people come to the website. Oh my gosh, they really like this message more. And that's just like something that's not replicable. And it's so powerful when you're a startup and mm-hmm. you're, you don't have money, like you just can't make I, it work. And so you've got to pull a rabbit out of a hat. I totally so get anyway, it. Totally yep, get it. It's a I, total business decision. Yeah. But it's uh it's packaged for retail. Like it's, yeah. it'll be like next time you talk, we'll talk. I'm sure you'll have it. But like it's big, typical looking. It's like very unexceptional in a lot of ways. It's very, very unique and special nutritional content, but like process used to make it extrusion, garden variety extrusion type of packaging that you find it in nice air sealed, big bags of kibble. Like it's, it's very, it's simple in, in a lot of ways. And if you, from a business perspective, if you can go through distribution, you're going to, that's where I'll, that's where you're going to be like, you want how much? I know. I'm uh-huh. so I've heard. Uh-huh. So I've heard. Uh-huh. And then uh, that's why our margins end up being so shitty. It's awful. I think it's, I mean, it's just three, three ways splitting it. You know, it's like the three main parties uh, outside of the consumer are going to like be sharing in the profits. and. It sounds like it. it's not even, but it does sound like, yeah, yeah. I'm sure everybody's not pleased. Every All three parties are like, I deserve more. I the definitely brand. deserve more. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so carbs are awful. That's our main message. Do you want to talk a little DCM and then we'll get into the lawsuit? Sure. So dilated cardiomyopathy. And literally, I can tell you that I have been telling customers that have been coming in and Faith, who's sitting here next to me, is one of my managers. She literally walked in my door today and said, I had to talk to two people about DCM today. So it is still happening, even though the FDA pulled the study almost a year ago. So uh, yes. Let's go. Yeah. it's, it's nuts. It's nuts. These it's people, not, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's 
they no longer need independent news events to happen because it's found its way into the veterinary community so comprehensively that that's it's going to live for a period of time there indefinitely despite lack of news or whatever people will hear from their veterinarian xyz about dcm and so that's not let me you know it's like I get cut since we sell online, I get customer service tickets directly. And so what you're describing that like every day today in 2024, people, I get them every day as well. Really? And it's much easier now. I go, oh yeah, we actually filed the largest lawsuit in the history of the pet food industry over this issue. Check it out. It's right here. Love it. It's much simpler (laughs) than having to explain to somebody like, no, your vet's wrong and I'm right. Like this guy that I'm emailing on the internet, but it it is true. It is true. Your vet is wrong. I talked to, because I'm, know a couple of vets local and there's one vet that said to me, any veterinary cardiologist that bought into this bullshit should be embarrassed. Oh yeah. Yeah. So look, I agree with that. Uh, it's like, I have a lot of empathy for what it means to be both a pet owner and pet food consumer and a veterinarian in this moment, this era. Like, as I explained in the book, there are really wealthy, really large, really well-established companies that are like doing things that are meant to deceive, you know, mm-hmm. but, and it is difficult. And they, they own the inf- information environment so comprehensively when it comes to veterinary education that you have to, the, the psychological work that you have to do to step outside yourself and go every this, this, that, you know, there's a, there's an expression where it's like, fi- you know, fishes don't realize they're in water. Like they, they have to re- remind themselves that, that, or they have to like yeah. somehow be self-aware to say like, this is water. That it's like that, where it's like if the textbook is coming is and the the professor and the curriculum and the 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 folks coming around to provide in continuing education all have this same affiliation. It's just the background, but yeah, yeah, it's uh, nevertheless the lack of scientific literacy that is required if you are somebody that is actively telling consumers to be worried about DCM and its potential linkage to BEG pet foods. It is, it's, it does not cast, it looks bad, man. It's like you have egg on your face. It's right. a, they made really big mistakes. And, um, the one did like, that's generally, that's not volitional. You know what I mean? It's like when I think of like the, the, the hierarchy of like how blameworthy, somebody is in all this, the people, the folks who are expected to have a high degree of scientific literacy, like a veterinarian, but end up making 101 level mistakes of scientific literacy. Okay. That's bad. That's professional mess up, but it's not intentional. When there's a level beyond that, that's like in between intentionality and just like generalized mistake making that I see all the time and it kills me, which is, it turns out that if your dog has diabetes, if you take all the carbohydrate out of its diet, that's a very good thing for it. Imagine. Who knew? What a thought. Unfortunately though, in the United States of America right now, the for the standard of care for a dog with diabetes is to put it on a prescription only diet made by Hills Pet Nutrition that's 40% digestible carbohydrate. Wow. That's very difficult for an animal. If anyone listening knows anything about diabetes, what it is is essentially you're allergic to carbohydrate. Okay. Mm-hmm. Your body can't process carbohydrate. Your dog's body can't process carbohydrate. So take so feeding it 40% dietary carbohydrate is not a great look. So when people whose dogs have diabetes switch from the standard of care on Tiquitona, they almost always have a wow moment where they're like, because these people monitor their dog's blood sugar. Mm -hmm. They're doing that as part of the treatment for diabetes. And they go, I saw what you said on the website. I thought I'd give it a try because we guarantee we're like, if you switch from Hills to our diet and your dog's blood sugar doesn't improve, we'll give your money back. Regulatorily, we can't say that our product cures diabetes or is better for your dog with diabetes. We're not allowed to say that. But we can say is if it doesn't work for your dog, we'll give you your money back. And so we promise it. Like that's a that's a different statement. And so people do it all the time, happens all the time. And the saddest thing is we get tickets where people go, 
I found your product. It was the best thing ever for my dog with diabetes. Helped him lose or help me man, buy less insulin. His glucose is under control. But now my vet is telling me I should switch over DCM concerns. Oh. Like I have a disease in <laughs> front of me that I am managing well. And, a, and the healthcare provider is coming in and saying, you should be more worried about this thing that's a disease that actually doesn't have a link to this. And it's so frustrating. Like, yeah, that's more than just mere mistake making. That's like professional negligence. That's like you have to expect more out of that that from a professional. But, but I think they're yeah. brainwashed. I, Dan, I. Me too. We are. It's not intentional. It's not like they're like actively, I'm a nasty person that's going to hurt your dog. Except for they maybe are. Lisa Freeman. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. Just clear. I'm talking about clinicians. <laughs> right. Clinicians who are actively trying to help dogs. They're not. Of course not. There are people that got into it because they love these animals. You know, like they're not. They are brainwashed. The information environment is tough. I get it. But there are some times where if it's like you've been misled, you got duped, you made the mistake, you still ha- there's expectations at certain guideposts. Like you, yep. you can't still violate the common sense rules, like the diabetes thing, where it's just like, wait a second, they're telling you that the disease they have got fixed, and you're telling them to reintroduce this to have the disease back. Like that's that's more than just brainwash. That's like you're violating enough common sense mistakes there that you. But I love how you said you have to psychologically take yourself. I don't know exactly what you said, but I feel like it was spot on. And it's almost like they have to let their ego go. I mean, you have to admit, I I don't know. Look, this is a difficult thing to sort of process. I can report on facts involving how vets are taught about nutrition, you know, like what school, what, what organizations are used, what materials used. The, the the more vague issues of like exactly why, what is the psychological tendency that's going on at a bigger scale is harder, you know, but I do think that there's this element of like, if you, so you've been practicing 20 years, right? And the whole time you've been towing the party line on diabetes, let's just say mm-hmm. you've been prescribing 40% diet and you're, somebody comes in 20 years into your career and is like, this guy on the internet said that if his food didn't wasn't better for my dog with diabetes, he gave me my money back. So I tried it and it's way better. You, you have to go like, have I been hurting? I've been yeah. giving bad advice for 20 years. Right. That is a hard thing to admit. And sure. the human mind will do gymnastics yep. to not have to admit that. Yep. And I sympathize. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard to do that. Like to say I made innocent mistakes when your job is like people expect you not to make mistakes. Yep. You know, Yep. you can get sued if you make mistakes in a medical context. Like I get it. I get it, but it is what it is. Right. Like I'm trying to like fix the system in some ways too, but it's always hard for me to see improvement without like thinking about, you have to get to people while they're like literally undergraduates and start mm-hmm. making change from there. That that's what you see typically in scientific communities. Like a new generation comes along and brushes aside ideas from the old generation. And the vet techs too. The yeah, even that's a difference. That's like totally brainwashed. Totally. I have. Yeah. Look in that case, context. Here's like you know, I have. My fiance has worked as a vet tech recently. I have no, I have as much love for vet techs as anybody in the world. But scientific literacy is something that is taught at upper education levels for some reasons. Like that's not, it's not, you know, when you say I use the like 101 level mistakes, that's a reference to like higher education. And it's like some of the concepts that the the tools you need to defend yourself against scientific misinformation come through higher education mm-hmm. in some times. And so that is a community that is more susceptible, mm-hmm. I think, to being misinformed and then spouting that misinformation inadvertently to clients. It, that's just kind of a, Agreed. that's a delicate topic to talk about. I'm not trying like my fiance is a wonderful, smart person, but it's like, 
there are there are differences there. Yes, absolutely. So, okay, so the DCM shit happened. Were you already thinking, you had to have been already thinking about a lawsuit? Sort of. Like, I mean, how like did... when, when the FDA announced that it was, like, does everybody, you think the folks that are listening to your show, like, understand when we say the DCM issue, they have a rough, most of them understand what we're talking about? Most of, most of my listeners, most of my customers understand. Okay. So when the FDA announced in 2018 that it was going to begin looking at whether grain-free dog foods, we could say grain-free as a stand-in for the group we're talking about because it's changed over the years. Yep. Pausing DCM. It was a, it caught my attention, you know, for a few reasons. Number one, I had already written this book about how the sausage is made in veterinary nutrition and how misinformation strategies are a part of that. And I know the playbook and I know the people that whose names have been involved in doing that in the past. And immediately it became immediately clear from the very earliest reporting about DCM that those tools, those tactics, and those people were involved here as well. So bing, 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 I'm suspicious about it. Second thing, of course, I'm running a company that is getting unfairly harmed by that story. My products do not give dogs DCM. And I nevertheless am being having like aspersions casted as a result of that. And it's threatening my livelihood, the existence of my company. So number two, I'm motivated to try to get to the bottom of this. Mm -hmm. And then number three, like, yeah, I, I, I'm, I have a lawyer and I know some things about, you know, the FDA is a governmental organization that touches up against law stuff. And I know about how to like, in essence, one of the things that I did very early that gave rise to the lawsuit is I actually sued the FDA in a not in like a way saying they really did much wrong necessarily. There's a, a law that's called the Freedom of Information Act. It's used by journalists most of the time. And it's like a law that says like the with subject to some exceptions, the government has to give you any records you ask for. So when you're like, I want to know how much money was given to this organization or whatever, they generally, the law says like they have to give it to you. There are a bunch of exceptions. They don't have to give me your social security number. They don't have to give me classified information, et cetera. But I was like, FDA, give me the whole, I knew something smelled wrong. And so I was like, just give me the whole file on DCM. And they were like, no, we don't have to because it's an ongoing investigation. So I sued them and I won. And I got 18,000 pages of documents over three years. They just sent me every six weeks a CD of FDA records redacted. And you get to see all the emails, all the word. Where do the cases come from? How are people corresponding with the FDA around this? And the, lo and behold, the evidence shows there's fraud. And so I've, I see fraud. I've been damaged by the fraud. You are going to get sued over it. And so that's, that's where the lawsuit came from. You're awesome. I fucking love you. <laughs> Seriously. It's Seriously. A you that it's like, are absolutely yeah. what the industry needs. And so. Why do you think so? I totally think that. I totally know that. I have been preaching since this DCM bullshit has come about that it was a bunch of bureaucratic bullshit. And my cust and I am the only one that says it. My employees, I have 50 employees they kind of tread softly through it, but I have spot on and my managers will have spot on honest conversations with customers. And there is so much to it that a lot of people don't want to hear right. it. They don't yeah, want to hear sure. it. Yep. But they I need to know. Up, like in my personal life, I never, we're on a podcast talking about it. I, I will tell you, I don't, I know veterinarians in my personal life. I know tons and tons of pet owners in my personal yeah. life. I never, ever talk yeah. about it because like in order to, when somebody in a hooded sweatshirt sitting on his, in his chair says to you that the US FDA and all these board certified nutritionists are wrong about something and you're right, I'm right. It is hard to be like, like you're either a tinfoil hat, crazy idiot yeah. or you're on to something. And in the case of the DCM controversy, to make that judgment, you have to go into the weeds pretty good. 
it, you can't, I can't tell you enough information in a two or three minute conversation for you to decide. And so you're probably going to default to this as a crazy person. So unless I have like a captive audience where I know, okay, I can just talk to this person for five minutes. They're going to understand some of the key things at play here. I just don't even try. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. TCM. Oh, I know. I know. And usually within a minute, like even if the, the, the topic comes up, you can tell right out of the gate if they're going to be receptive to what you're saying or they're going to be like, mm-hmm. oh, no, oh, no. My vet said I have to feed grains. My vet yep. said. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So so I have to say, being devil's advocate, how are you going to. Because you know, don't you think some people are going to say, well, he owns a pet food company. Of course, he's going to bring this up. There's there's agenda behind what he's doing. What's your what's yeah. what's your what's your response to that? Of course, there's an agenda. I'm, I've been damaged by somebody committing fraud. OK, our company, which had begun like a year before this came out got unfairly painted with the brush that it was killing dogs. Yep. Okay. Like that. Yes. I am motivated to correct that. It's like to say that that is like, yeah, it's, it, it just feels like, yeah, I have an agenda. You bet. But there's more to it. I feel it's, it's an agenda to fix the whole thing. It's not just about Ketona. Oh, so do you, are you asking me whether I do have an agenda to try to fix the broader industry? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. That's a part of my, that is my professional that's, mission is to like same. make pet care a more evidence-based whole, you know, a, a, a kind of environment that gets better out health outcomes than we're currently getting, which yeah. is, you know, I don't know. I stopped myself from using bad language there, but like. <laughs> It's very bad. Okay. <laughs> it's like it's prevalence of obesity, diabetes, osteoarthritis, cancer, all diseases that have in one degree way or another, some links to nutrition. They're too common and popular and deadly for us to be like, that's fine. This is just a good enough system. Like, the, yeah. So yes, I'm trying to make broader change. And my hope is that in part, People who see the truth about the DCM controversy come to light through the reporting on the lawsuit will take that. It's like one one key important thing about the facts underlying the lawsuit, the allegations in the suit, are that DCM is not a standalone issue. It's not a scheme. We don't allege that these the bad guys got together to come up with one standalone scheme. It is a part of a broader scheme that they have been carrying out for a longer period of time. And so what I, the ideal takeaway in my judgment from learning, somebody who digs into the lawsuit and gets to know all that stuff is they go, not only have my eyes been open about the DCM controversy, but they've been open more broadly to the issues I reported on the book, the court, the like conflicts of interest and misinformation, all that kind of generalized stuff. Um, yeah, I, w- I would like that stuff to be more resonant, uh, be understood by more people. And three big companies dominating the pet food industry. Generally speaking, three certainly dominate the um you know, veterinary misinformation space, I would say. Yep. Yep. They're, they do, you know, it's like, there are lots of big pet food companies. Now you're right that there are three that are particularly large, um, and thereby particularly influential. Yep. Um, but yeah, and they all have, I mean, it's like very important to note that like they all have a very, very important, shared quality, which is that for them, they are propping up the healthfulness of dietary carbohydrate. Like carbohydrate is used so widely in all of their products that they have a very, very vested interest in making sure that the public doesn't think carbohydrate is particularly bad for animals. It's like, I say this all the time, like carbohydrate is more central to what Hills Pet Nutrition, Nestle Purina Pet Care do, than like tobacco is to a cigarette company. It is a part of 
all of the products. It's a central component. If you were to like, if Purina were to buy, for example, say we're going to make a zero carbohydrate kibble, they would have to charge two times, three mm-hmm. times as much what they charge for their products. Like it would blow up the business model. It doesn't work that way. Nope. And so, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. they, they've for so long been building products and margins around using increasing amounts of dietary carbohydrate, which are so inexpensive compared to meat-based protein that it's like they are, the ship is, I'll mix my metaphors, but they're irrevocably committed to that course. It's a foundational part of the way that the businesses are built. It is. And I think our next conversation, Daniel, I would love to get into more why they love those carbohydrates. And what part of the the industry that pulls from the corn, the wheat, the soy, the oh, yeah, yeah, all, yeah, the, yeah. Like, all the GMO is- shit. And so we could get into that at some point too. The history is interesting. You yeah. know, the why is sort of like it's there are multiple factors as ever, but one thing that's very hard to escape is that like dietary carbohydrate doesn't just cost less than meat-based protein, it costs like one-tenth. So if you can find a way to maximize the use of that and minimize the use of the thing that costs 10 times as much, that's good for your bottom line. That is a cheaper product to make. You're making more product or making more profit on each unit sold. It's pretty one-on-one. But yeah, so it's like one of these things, something I talk about often is like, Industries often will spring up and become big before the health consequences of their products become known. And it's like, it's really relevant in this case. It's like, these guys came up with really useful products. They were like, we are going to make this dog food stuff that's really shelf stable. Yeah, it's gonna, Dogs are going to love to eat it easiest thing in the world for consumers. You just scoop it out, put it out, done. Really inexpensive. It's great on a million levels. And so of course, boom, becomes a huge industry. Huge. Everybody got dogs, huge industry, industry norm. Huge companies spring up to, you know, that own the space. They're doing billions of dollars of business. And then people start learning, oops, the science starts coming out. Yeah, it turns out carbohydrate isn't so good for these guys. And oh, no, it's even worse than we realize. Oh, no, it's even worse than we realize. Nobody at Hills Pet Nutrition set out to like, we're going to start this company to hurt dogs, like something like that. Like, of course not. But instead, it's like the creep of evil. You know, it's like you start out with a good intention, but it's really hard to turn the ship around once it's like committed to one kind of course. Absolutely. Fossil fuel companies or cigarette companies or whatever, like nobody. Cereal for humans. Cereal. Yeah, of course. Exact same thing. So. Um, Yeah. Like nobody would um, like (laughs) you wouldn't be able as somebody that knows the startup community, like you couldn't get startup funding for like, I'm going to start a cigarette company right now. Or like, (laughs) I'm going to start a fossil fuel company. It's like, well, no, once people know that it does bad things, they don't do it that way anymore. Um, but when they're large, before they realize it, that's a whole different story. Then people's jobs are on the line and their profits are on the line. Like, And so. that's how the DCM came to be because they were losing profit margins to smaller yep. pet food companies. 100%. Right. Yeah, it's a big uh, fat, you know, there's a chart. If folks that are listening have the time and the interest to spend their afternoon reading a 125 page document about pet food law, you can go check out the complaint in the lawsuit. But like, there's, I think, only really one or two like visual charts in it. And one of them is like Hills. Hills is a publicly traded, it's a division of a publicly traded company. So they have to disclose their annual financial yep. numbers every year. And th- we have a chart that shows their financial performance in the period before and after the DCM controversy began. And it went up, up, up. Well, more than that. It's like a complete, it's such an inflection point, so pronounced. It's like in the five years leading up to the DCM controversy, Hills revenues grew a grand total of 1%. 
Okay. One <gasps> percent collectively over five years, not one percent per year. Collectively. collectively, dead flat. And over that same time, the U.S. pet food industry grew by something like thirty something percent. So you're talking about huge loss of market share in the five years leading up to that. The DCM controversy begins, and instantly the revenues begin growing. So in the five years since the DCM controversy began, Hill's revenues have almost, not quite, but almost doubled. Damn it. They didn't grow at all for five years. DCM, they grew from $2.3 billion to $4.2 billion last year. Fuck. And it's just like the line couldn't be more stark. And there's an, a way, a, a, an extent to which I feel like evil genius respect for it. You know what I mean? It's not like yeah. real respect, but it's like yeah. you have to be impressed by the scale of the achievement in a way. Like it worked super well, even though it's complete horseshit. Complete horseshit. Okay. So where can we find these charts? Oh, uh, you can find news reporting about the lawsuit if you Google it. Like, it's not hard to find okay. stuff where it links out to the material that is the lawsuit. If you go to the website for Keto Natural Pet Foods, so the suit was brought on behalf of Keto Natural. It's class action lawsuits. We're asking the court to let Keto Natural represent other companies that have been damaged in the same way. But if you go to ketonaturalpetfoods.com, you can learn everything you want to learn about the lawsuit. You can learn everything you want to learn about the products and Perfect. buy them if they feel good to you. Um, learn, there's a, we do a lot of education there. So there's a lot of videos and podcasts and articles and stuff like that. So if you're motivated to learn more about evidence-based pet care, it's a good place to go. That's probably the best place to tell people to go. But like if you Google uh, Keto Natural or Hills lawsuit, you'll, find all the relevant stuff. Okay. And we'll have that all in our show notes. Um, any final thoughts, Daniel? I know we'll talk again, but stay tuned. yeah, I mean, stay tuned. It's scary. Like th that's, I, I like have done a lot of interviews over the past month. And so I, I'm getting a little like, like it, my demeanor can sort of betray the amount of anxiety that I feel over it all. Like let it not escape you that it's really scary to essentially take on somebody as big and as powerful and as well established in a community that I'm ultimately trying to influence. Like I would like the veterinary community to be somewhat different yes. and you know, it, it taking needs to on be different. Their, I know, but it's when, also scary to put yourself in front of them and say, Hey, this, this company that you love is bad. They're bad. And here I'm, I'm. What can we do? What can we do? What can the average consumer do? What can I do? What can we do? What can you do um, about like what? To, to just help generally you. improve? To help, to, help to, you? to help you, to help the oh. mission, to help because it it's going to take a village. Have me back on the show. I'll keep talking about it. I okay. mean, like, I'm not going to it's not going anywhere. And so, uh, there will be interesting news. There will be like one thing that often happens with lawsuits in my experience is that they get boiled down to reporting that doesn't capture the like context and the richness of what's actually happening. So like there are, I don't know, we could win this lawsuit win, and it's not actually bad for the bad guys. We could lose this lawsuit and have all sorts of important facts be established. And it's like, good for our side. Hmm. So it's like important to talk it, about it and mm -hmm. go into it more than just like headline. And it's hard. Like it's this, just like the underlying issue. It doesn't lend itself well to one sentence summary. That's why it's a problem is because the one sentence summary misses all the important context. And so having me back where I can talk about it, you know, and, and encourage folks to read stuff um, is very helpful. And then there's a stage, this is not really a request for help. This is like me just kind of helping you understand, like it, in addition to the judicial system, the like serious investigative journalistic system 
is important to this too. That's like another place where people take very seriously the going into the weeds to report on truth. And so as you'll see over the lawsuit, there are folks who I respect who are in the process of doing that stuff. And so, yeah, there will you staying abreast of that is a good thing. Well, we're behind you 100%. 100%. And thank you for doing what you're doing. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I look forward to being back on the show. Um, I look forward to talking with you more. Maybe one day you'll carry keto natural products and, um, we'll do business together. Maybe. I I think it's a win-win. Yeah, good. sounds like it. All right. Thanks, Daniel. Talk soon. Bye-bye.